Death is all around us. It happens every day, but we can't see it. Could you imagine living in a country where 13 people on average are murdered every single day? Probably not, because if you're watching this, you're probably white, British, and very privileged. Stars shine bright above. Today I'm going to be talking about the highest murder rate on each continent of the world, the laws behind it and some of the reasons why it may have the high murder rate. Now just as a little background using UK murder law here, in the year ending March 2019 there were 671 victims of homicide. Now female victims were more likely to be killed by a partner or ex-partner which equates to around 38% of homicides. Males were more likely to be killed by a friend or an acquaintance which is around 27%, which equates to around 105 homicides a year. Popular culture media, whilst not always accurate, can give us a good representation of the countries which hold the most violence, and certainly should give us a good representation of the countries we should probably avoid. Now, for those of you who have seen Narcos, would know that Central America is a pretty neat hotspot for spurring violence and homicide, giving the lack of societal structure. But although Central America is not a continent, I thought it would still be quite interesting to talk about. El Salvador and Honduras are known for having the highest murder rate in the world. These were the two featuring countries in Narcos and for those of you who have seen it will know that the high murder rate can be attributed to the vast divide between government officials and individuals. Individuals in particular who were in gangs, some of these gangs were to gain territory and control over borders so they could smuggle drugs. The ultimatum if you didn't comply with this was being killed which in the end Pablo Escobar the drug Kingping, who had the biggest gang in Honduras, was untouchable. He bought out nearly every police officer for loyalty with millions of pounds, simultaneously bringing them to shame and really compromising the humility in their careers. Now, for those of you who've seen it will know that government officials were huge targets for gangs, and this is very much a real representation of real life. But since 2010, 84 lawyers have been killed. Marcos aside for a second, 13 people on average are murdered every day in Honduras. I think a reason for this is a continued cycle of impunity. This means Means that the less people are punished for their conduct the less they're going to worry about the consequences of their conduct and so they stop caring and this makes sense because only four percent of, of homicides have ended in conviction this is not substantial enough to deter people from killing in the first place. A snippet of research I found within looking at the law on murder within Honduras and something I found quite interesting was that they use the phrase simple homicide for a 15 to 20 year sentence. Now in the UK a 15 to 20 year sentence would be looking at the higher tier so looking towards really serious. However this language just seemed to completely abrogate the seriousness and gravity of the crime of murder and just goes to show how serious murder as a crime in that particular country can extend to. Now although I know that the law of the language be archaic, quite old and not often updated, but this just goes to show how bad murder can get in this country. <laughs> one of the most beautiful countries in the world, South Africa, Cape Town, is known to be one of the worst for homicide rates in the world. Now, from April 2018 to March 2019, there were 21,000 murders in the country. That's insane. Because South Africa is a Commonwealth country, you would think their laws are not hugely different. However, their system is completely. The Majeski rule um, is a huge element in UK criminal law. However, they don't use it over there. And what the Majeski rule is, basically, is it introduces concepts of voluntary intoxication and involuntary intoxication. So essentially, in the UK, you can't go to a court of law and be like, well, I was drunk, so I can't remember. Because you voluntarily got yourself there in the first place. Whether involuntary intoxication is for instance where you may have been spiked or this is where for instance if you took medication um, and you accidentally overdosed on it and that caused the adverse effect and caused you to kill someone despite the law itself in South Africa in almost every country the court have a substantial amount of leeway if we take Oscar Pistorius's case for example who was the professional sprinter and also in the Paralympics he was only sentenced six years for manslaughter for what seemed to be intentional murder and was later overturned for now the reason for this I believe was because 
he had a good defence barrister, his defence barrister made a lot of convincing points but I also think what attributed to this decision was that it's a judge based system which means that the judge has a lot of discretion. After this case the mental element in South African law became a worldwide interest because it's vastly different from that of UK law and other common law systems. South African law uses the subjective element which essentially means that you have to be sure that the person in their mind was going to commit the murder. It was not enough that he could have foreseen it, he must have foreseen it. Now this is vastly different from the mental element of UK murder law because it uses an objective test which essentially brings this concept of putting the jury shoes in the defendant's position from an objective perspective so they all have to get to the same conclusion and think to themselves in this situation um, would they have done the same thing. But what made Oscar's case particularly more difficult was that it's very common in South Africa to keep armed with weapons because of the high risk of violence and so it was easy for Oscar to use the intruder as a scapegoat. Now this high risk of violence could be attributed to the divide between communities because it is estimated that in South Africa alone there are 93 gangs of around 100,000 members. I do really recommend the documentary on Netflix because it's a very interesting case with a lot of interesting points on criminal law. There is various speculations and reasons as to why the homicide rate is so high in South Africa but it's not such a modern issue. It's one that dates back half a century which marked a social and spatial divide of community groups. Now in the 1960s the apartheid scheme enforced racial discrimination against non-whites where they were dumped in flats and joined communities. This obviously led to status frustration and separation conflict which led people to join gangs as a way to avoid the cluster of people and lack of economic development. Now in recent times South Africa is considered to be in a national crisis with unemployment with 47% of youths being unemployed compared to the 12% in UK. <laughs> In Brazil, intentional homicide ranges from 6 to 20 years, where in the UK we start the life sentence with 25 years. Now the difference is in the UK you only get half that life sentence and off with good behaviour, which I do think is a corrupt concept, but at least we don't let our prisons overcrowd like undeveloped countries do. And what makes it even more corrupt in undeveloped countries like Brazil is that they do have to serve that full sentence between 6 to 20 years in impoverished conditions. Now with unintentional homicide which is called manslaughter in the UK, in Brazil they serve a one to three year sentence whereas in the UK it's two to ten years with the judge's discretion. I also love how UK genderized the term manslaughter despite its western uh, values on equality. This just goes to show how cultured the law still is with their language and impressions despite the radicalization and movement of society. Fantasize which is the killing of a newborn in Brazil constitutes a completely different crime to murder with a max of five years punishment in prison. In comparison to UK it's a life imprisonment sentence Now, I think this suggests the strength of our human rights laws and values especially when we joined the European Union we had the European Courts of Human Rights to rely on. Now just out of curiosity for those of you who are wondering we do still have the U European Court of Human Rights to rely on post Brexit. Now I did find the law itself quite strange because generally uh, Brazil is quite a Catholic society with 64% being Catholic. This is around 124 million people out of the 200 million people so quite a substantial amount of people and generally Catholics do place value on human life and dignity as well as being against abortion whereas UK is a society that's very pro-choice. However we do have to consider mitigating circumstances like postnatal depression and rape which probably do attribute to why the sentence is so low. It is estimated that 180 cases of rape take place each day in Brazil. In the UK there are 11 cases per hour of sexual assault. This is by far the most common case of crime in the world. Something else I found quite interesting in Brazilian law is they call those who mistakenly kill another, uh, they use the phrase negligent homicide in comparison to UK who use 
gross negligence. Now this really shows that UK do judge others um, more often than not than those in undeveloped countries. For those of you who are confused by what gross negligence is, by way of example the most common cases you would get is probably industrial negligence or medical negligence. With medical negligence often performed mistakenly by doctors, for example if you had a doctor who forgot to turn on a certain switch on the machine or forgot to inject the patient with something um, that, that was urgent in order to save that patient's life that would result in the patient's death it was an obvious mistake however it wouldn't be the case for instance if the patient was going to die anyway and then the doctor tried to save them but couldn't that would not be the case at all um, and that is a case which all you law students will know um, it was a case of Johanna's witness who who refused to take a blood transfusion to save um, her life and in that instance a doctor would not be at fault either if it was the patient's choice um, in industrial negligence it could be as simple as you know not putting a hazard warning sign up or not um, leaving something in the way and that results in, in, in someone's death a few other interesting legal facts about Brazil. Aiding and abetting a crime holds a four-year max sentence in comparison to 14 years in the UK. Now, aiding, it means aiding a crime. So, for example, taking a knife away from a crime scene and hiding it for someone. Or it could literally be as simple as not participating in a rape but watching it. You're still aiding by allowing that person to do so. Now, I think there are many reasons for why the sentence is very low in, in Brazil but I think in comparison to the UK it just shows how much we value life to punish those who abuse the law. However we also have to consider that there are many gangs in Brazil and so keeping the sentence low seems sensible otherwise prisons would severely overcrowd. The age of criminal liability in Brazil starts at 14. This is in comparison to the age of 10 years in the UK. Now in my opinion I do agree with Brazil on this because I think, you know, most mental health conditions and mental awareness, psychologically proven, develops at the age of 14. And it is common for there to be a correlation with mental health problems and crime. And so I think that would make it easier to identify. But the whole reason in the first place that UK decided to set the age of 10 years for criminal responsibility was to identify patterns of early offending. In Brazil, the principle of strict liability is not recognised. Now, strict liability in the UK is quite a big thing because of the amount of industrialisation we have. It basically is an action crime. It doesn't consider the mental element like a lot of other crimes do example it doesn't consider the fact that you might have not intended to do something it just enforces the fact that you did it and you have to get on with it it usually is enforceable by a fine so for example when someone sells a 16 year old a lottery ticket they would probably get a fine and it's often enforced in driving offences <laughs> with the highest homicide rate in Asia was Kazakhstan. Afghanistan and Iraq do come within the ranks of highest murder rates also but we have to bear in mind that those deaths are attributed to the military operations that happen in that country. The death penalty still exists for terrorism and grave crimes. Now something I found interesting about the law in, in Kazakhstan is that omissions are not recognised. Now these are major in UK criminal law. It's basically the duty to care for another so it upholds society, society structures and the relationships within that society. So for example the responsibility a, a parent has to a child or um, an individual has to their housing responsibilities not to cause a fire and to harm others. The country with the highest homicide rate in Europe is Lithuania, with 70% of murders happening in the home being domestic and with 60% of murders involving the influence of alcohol, which was a spurring problem resulting from the depressive state of the post-Soviet Union atmosphere, which caused a, caused a lot of tension among society as well as lowest employment rates ever seen, with still a low employment rate of 18.3%. I also came across some interest in history of Lithuania which could attribute to the social and spatial divide of community groups. In 2018 Poland passed a bill publicly setting a max of three year fines for anyone who publicly states that they shared responsibility for the Third Reich crimes. Now 250,000 Jews were killed in Lithuania during the Holocaust and when they set this bill it caused a lot of protest in aid of taking responsibility and not distorting history. <laughs>
Murder is considered to be an epidemic in Jamaica. In 2019, 1,326 homicides occurred. This is around four murders a day. Now, there are a lot of things that attribute to the homicide rate in Jamaica. However, of the most notorious is probably the Jamaican lotto scam. This is where the scammer leads the victim to believe that a lotto prize is to be won on the basis of fees. A lot of criminals have killed through this method for financial gain. The main contributor of homicide in Jamaica goes very deep into its locational beauty. Jamaica lying as it does between the world's biggest cocaine and heroin markets in the south and largest consumer markets in the north make it a convenient country for drug trafficking as well as its layout with long lengthy coastlines making it ideal for transporting narcotics which are nearly impossible to patrol effectively. Its developing status ensured demand for illegal goods and services which are dominated by local gangs. The involvement in gangs and violence can be attributed to many different historical factors. In 1959, the violence plague general elections saw the two main parties, which were the Labour Party and the National People's Party, engage in a battle for dominance. Rival party supporters were forced out of opposition, controlled residential areas, resulting in the violent forging of political identities uh, amongst spatial boundaries. This led to the establishment of a large-scale state-sponsored and politically controlled housing divisions known as garrisons. These remained in place until the early 1980s, becoming symbols of the institutionalised criminal power structures. Politicians and dons became mutually dependent on one another. Dons would serve members of the parliament by politically supporting them by getting votes from their community in exchange for patronage, access to arms and space to carry out the illegal activities. In return, the Dons could provide them with social goods such as housing, food, medical assistance, policing services and even early childhood education for those citizens who were loyal to them. In this way, gangs have become empowered and ingrained in the fabric of daily life, with some of the gang leaders even becoming role models. In this way, we live in a system that values and legitimises criminal organisations and communities which are set up to respond to high levels of violent crime which can be applied to the understanding of gang culture around the world and in particular why homicide is so rife in gang cultured countries. Thank you guys for watching this video and thank you for getting me to 115 subscribers. Really appreciate the support. Make sure you go to follow my Law Students Unite Insta page where I post constant updates on legal content, my YouTube videos, career guidance and everything related and in between. It would be particularly useful if you are a law student or you're interested in law and looking to go into it. I also have an equality blog called Man Made Dreams if you're interested in issues in equality and obscured issues on gendered norms in society. Thanks guys, see you next time.